Thank you. All righty, it's good to see all of you here this evening and uh, to be up here on the mountain. I'm not used to coming to Bible study where it's almost all men. Uh, usually it's the reverse <laughs> ratio. <laughs> yeah, I see that. Um, but anyway, uh, we'll, we'll get started. And uh, let's see. Sheldon, why don't you uh, lead us in an opening prayer, sir? Right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and this gathering today to study your word and uh, read David to uh, instruct us what you have to instruct us for so we learn and, and gain from your word. And watch out all over everyone that's here today and uh, be with all those people here. In his name, amen. Amen. All right, I need for somebody to read. Galatians chapter 2, uh, the first 14 verses. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up in response to a revelation. Then I laid before them, though only in a private meeting with the acknowledged leaders, the gospel that I proclaimed among the Gentiles, in order to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not compelled to be circumcised, though he was Greek. But because a false believer secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might enslave us, we did not submit to them even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might always remain with you. And from those who were supposed to be acknowledged leaders, what they actually were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those leaders contributed nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel for the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter making him an apostle to the circumcised also worked through me in sending me to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who were acknowledged pillars, recognized the grace that had been given to me, they gave to Barnabas and me the right hand of fellowship, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They asked only one thing, that we remember the poor, which was actually what I was eager to do. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood self-condemned. For until certain people came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But after they came, he drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision faction. And the only Jews and the other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was led astray by, the, by their hypocrisy. But when I saw what they... Gracious, I can't see. But when I saw that they were not acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Thank you. Now, uh, in our last episode, uh, we had uh, the conversion of Paul, formerly known as Saul, and after his retreat in Arabia, uh, in three years, he goes up, he meets with the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, he spends a short time with them, and he wants uh, the Galatians to know that he didn't get his gospel from them. He got it by direct revelation from the Lord. And uh, now he's making another trip. And it's 14 years later. And uh, this time he, took, he, he takes Titus with him. Uh, Titus is one of his helpers. Uh, Paul always surrounded himself with others. And part of that was when you live in the ancient world, there were a lot of dangers that they faced. And it was always good to have more than one present. You know, the Lord sent the apostles out, the disciples, two by two, if you remember that, the 70. 
And uh, the other piece of this is that if you take people with you, they are learning by doing. And if you think about uh, the ones that Jesus had, Jesus had great crowds that followed him, but there were circles in those crowds. And the majority of those people who followed him were on the outer circle. But the closer you get to him, the more intimate the relationships are. And uh, we often talk about the 12 and the 70 and so on in the Gospels. Those are circles of people uh, that followed Jesus. And they were learning from him. They were watching him, not only what he taught them, not only the words out of his mouth, but what he was doing. And there needs to be a consistency between what we say and what we do. Uh, You know, there's a a scripture text, I believe it's in James' little letter, uh, be ye not hearers of the word, but doers also. And uh, we always need to think about the consistency there. It says that uh, I went up by revelation and communicated unto them the gospel, uh, which I preach among the Gentiles, But he did not do that publicly. He had a private meeting with them. And that would have been James, John, and Cephas, or Peter. And uh, the reason that he did that was that he wanted to know from them uh, that uh, his apostolate to the Gentiles was approved and that the gospel he preached was consistent with theirs. And uh, he said, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. And uh, one of the things that uh, I often think about when I read this scripture is Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, where it says, let us run with persistence or perseverance or endurance the race that is set before us. And, uh, you know, Christian discipleship is in many ways a race. Uh, It's not always at top speed. It is certainly not a dash. It's more of a marathon. And we are surrounded by other runners. And uh, our duty as Christians with one another is that not to compete with one another, but to make sure that we all get to the end of the race. And we talked about that a little bit uh, last week when we talked about uh, the Pilgrim's Progress. And then he says, verse 3, Neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And uh, again, circumcision was a sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham. And we want to talk a little bit about Abraham. Uh, Abraham is a very important figure in Judaism Because in the Jewish faith, uh, they believe that they are literally the descendants of Abraham. That is to say, the blood descendants. In Christianity, we are all the children of Abraham, Gentile and Jewish alike, because we have been grafted onto the tree of faith by Jesus. And then also you have Islam, And in Islam, Abraham functions as one of the prophets between Adam, who is their first prophet, and Muhammad, who is their last prophet. And so that is how they view him. And of course, uh, when Jewish people and Christian people think about Abraham, uh, our lineage, so to speak, is through Isaac, who is the child of promise. Uh, In Islam, the lineage is through Ishmael, And if you know the story of Abraham, uh, Abraham and his wife, Sarah, that was their later names, Abram and Sarah, I guess were were the first names, uh, they lived in a place called Ur. And when Abram was 75 years old, God told him, it's time for you to move. I want you to go over to this place, which is the land of Canaan, is how it's described in scripture. And there you'll find your resting place. And by resting place, what he meant was 
not that you're, you're going to hang out and cool off and chill and so on, but it's this kind of resting place. That is to say, you're, you're going to find your tomb there. Uh, but I'm going to promise you that you are going to have descendants that will possess that land, and they will be as numerous as the sands of the sea. So that was the promise uh, that Abram had. And uh, he packs up, goes over there. Uh, now, I want you to think about that. You know, if you were 75 years old and God tells you to go somewhere where you've never been, and it's not a matter of a U-Haul, it's not a matter of across town, uh, it's not a matter of going to a new house, it's a matter of packing up everything, driving all the livestock out, and, uh, you know, living in the tents. And so that was, that was a big thing for him. But Abram was obedient to God. Well, time passes. And Abram and Sarah continue to age. They're in their 80s now. Uh, I believe he's about 85 when Sari decides she's going to move things along. And what she does is she takes Hagar, and we're going to talk about Hagar later. Uh, Hagar is a slave woman, her servant. And she says to Abram, now why don't you go in to uh, Hagar and you all have the child. And sure enough, the child comes along uh, and he's named Ishmael. Well, if you think about it, they are doing what sometimes Christians try to do, and that is bring in the kingdom of God by their own action. And one of the things that we need to be very careful about uh, as followers of God is if God promises something, God will do what God says, and we do not have to help God. Did you hear that? So... Even though these are people of faith, uh, they're really trying to run ahead of the Lord, and it has some consequences. Finally, these three messengers of God show up at the tent curtain, the door, and uh, they say, when we come back next year, you're going to have a son. And, of course, Sari laughs uh, because she thinks, you know, we're in our 90s now, uh, we're not likely to be having children. But sure enough, the child of promise is born. And as time passes along, this creates some interesting family dynamics. One of the things that I had to do when I was a seminary student was do what is called a genogram. And that is a form of genealogy where you go back and you look at several generations of your family and you draw an X in a circle if the woman is dead, you draw an X in the square if the man is dead, you draw lines between them. You, you, you all have seen genealogy charts. But you put things like uh, what their occupation was, what they died of, uh, and their spiritual life. You talk about that. And so... I learned a whole lot about my family that way. One of my instructors called it uh, the 12 Stations of the Cross. I didn't think it was quite that bad, but, you know, that's, that's what the man said. But we also had to pick a family from the Bible. And so for the family from the Bible, I picked Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if you think about the kind of lifestyle that they were living... Uh, it was an incredibly complex lifestyle because they would have children by women who were not their wives. They were having children by the slaves. So you have here Hagar and Ishmael, and you have Sarah and Isaac. And so Ishmael is making fun of or mocking Isaac and Sarah goes to the husband, to Abraham, and says, you need to get rid of her and him because I'm not going to put up with this. Now, there's some marital politics. And anybody that's been married 
knows that there are politics in marriage. Okay, anytime you get any two people together, there's some kind of politics going on there. But when you have two women who are the parents of your two children, it's, it's a hard thing. And so Abraham seeks God. God says, you go ahead and do what your wife said, but you make sure that she's taken care of. And so he gives them water and, and salt and things that they need and casts them out. And uh, she goes back to uh, her people, and he finds a wife in Egypt. That's where she was from. And so the story goes on. When you think about Abraham, uh, the covenant that God made with Abraham was sealed uh, by circumcision. For the Christian, that is not the seal of the covenant. And we talked a little bit about that last time, but I want to say again, the seal of the Christian covenant is baptism. When we are baptized, that is a profession of faith. When we go down in the water, that is a way of publicly saying, I am a child of God. I accept that I'm a child of God. I'm a follower of Jesus. I have made a covenant with God, with God's people, and uh, we make promises to one another. Uh, if you ever go to a baptism, you're going to hear people make vows, make promises, and those are sacred things. And so that's the seal of the Christian covenant. Now, I will say to you that, uh, you know, not everybody baptizes adults. You know, that's the way the Church of the Brethren does. That's the way some of our other denominations around do. There are some that baptize infants. And when they own their faith, they do it by a process that's called confirmation, uh, which is a little bit different than what we're used to. Uh, we always need to be careful that we do not condemn people that practice their faith as Christians, not quite like we do. You know, I deal with 93 churches all the time, and I can tell you that in those 93 churches, there are a variety, a diversity of practice on how people do things. And we don't notice it as much because we're not over there with them, we're over here with us. But if you travel around, uh, you begin to notice it. Now, I want to talk a little bit about progressive revelation. Okay? Uh, are any of you all that are 60 or older smarter than you were when you were 30 or younger? Okay, why is that? Experience. Okay, experience. You have life experience. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's an experience that we don't want to have. You know, all of our experiences in life are not pleasant, are they? And, you know, sometimes, as my mother used to say when I was a little boy, we have to learn the hard way. Yeah, you, you, you all know about that. Uh, you learn from your mistakes. And I think that one thing that we always need to be clear about is we are all going to make mistakes. We all have made mistakes. Right. Uh, we have done things we shouldn't do. Uh, we've not done things that we ought to do. And we know who we are. The important thing about it is that we learn from them. That we learn from them. Because as we learn from them, we turn and we go a different way. And I want you to think about uh, the prodigal son for a moment or two. You all remember the prodigal son? Uh, it's a beautiful story. The younger of two sons, he tells his daddy, I can't wait for you to die. I want what's mine now. And in due time, he gets it. He goes off. And it's, uh, you know, wine, women, and song, parties and pals. And at the end of the day, so to speak, he finds himself starving. He finds himself without anything. And where does he find himself? In the hog pen. That's right. He's in the hog pen. 
And you remember, Jesus is Jewish. He's telling this, this story to Jews. You know, they're not real fond of pork. So for this presumably young Jewish boy to be down there with the pigs, feeding the pigs, and wanting to eat what they, they're eating, uh, how low can you go? David, I like what Jay Bernard McGee said about that. He said that boy didn't remain in the hog pen because he wasn't a hog. That's right. Hey, that's, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's pretty good, David. Well, what I always think about when I think about that is the, the words, he came to himself. And what that means is he came to his better self, what he was supposed to be, and he knew that the father would take him back even as a slave. And so he gets up out of the pig pen and he starts toward the father. And in that story, you have illumination, which in Christian faith means the spirit spoke to him and showed him who he really was, not who he hoped he was, but who he really was. You have faith because he believes that he will be received, and you have repentance because he gets up and gets out. And uh, when the father sees him, the father's reaction is not to reject him, it's to run and embrace him and to have a party. Now, one of the reasons that Jesus told that story is uh, he was also speaking to the Pharisees and scribes. And when you get to the older brother who is not really happy with the father because, well, here's the, the uh, ne'er-do-well son, and he comes back home. He's wasted his third of the estate, and the father throws a party for him. And the significance of the rings on the finger and the shoes on the feet is that he is not a slave. He is a son. Because you don't give slaves shoes, because if you do, what are they going to do? They're going to run. And so if you think about the old spiritual song, All God's Children Got Shoes, there's, there's a story behind that. Think about that. So progressive revelation is that God has been revealing God's self to humanity throughout a long period of time. And all of these covenants of the Old Testament are a part of the progressive revelation of God. Now, the reason that that's important is that we are going to get to the subject of the law. And by the law, we mean the commandments of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, uh, the thou shalts and the thou shalt nots. And the law was very important. Okay, They believed that the angels gave it to Moses on Mount Sinai, and it set the Israelites, the Hebrew people, apart as a nation of priests. So, it's extremely important. But there are two kinds of law in there at least. One of them is the ceremonial law, which is for the tabernacle, which is for the temple. Uh, if you go back and you read all the measurements that are there, uh, that's ceremonial law. All of these uh, things like the, the Nazarites where they trim not the corner of their beard, that's ceremonial law. Uh, where it talks about the priest duties, that's the ceremonial law. All that has to do with the tabernacle and the temple. But then you have what we might call the moral law. And that is something like uh, do not bear false witness, do not commit adultery, do not do this, do not do that. Um, honor thy father and mother that thy days may be long. Uh, you know, the commandments. And there are more of them than just the Ten Commandments. Uh, but they're there. That is the moral law. The purpose of that was to demonstrate that none of us can justify ourselves by our morality. 
Now, that is not to say that we should be, uh, the big word for it is antinomian against the law. Uh, That is not to say that we should strive to be immoral or sin boldly that grace might abound. Uh, But it means that we recognize we cannot be good enough to satisfy God. But the grace note in that is, and here's where the progressive revelation piece comes in again, that God is already satisfied with us in Jesus. Did you hear that? Uh, You know, God loves us. And sometimes that message gets lost when we are striving to do the right thing uh, for our own selfish spiritual purposes. You know, I'm going to justify myself before God and humankind. Well, the fact is, we all know, whether the neighbors know or not, that we fail at points. You know, I think about being a teenager and some of the things I did uh, that, you know, really... uh, It was in-your-face stuff with mamas and daddies, if you know what I mean. Uh, You know, I look back on that and I think, man, that was dumb. But at the time, I was self-differentiating. So when Jesus comes along, Jesus fulfills the law. And so for the Christian... Jew and Gentile alike. Jesus is the sacrifice. He is the vehicle of forgiveness. He is the one who opens the door. Now again, that doesn't mean just because you know Jesus, you ought to live any old which way. Hear me say that. And again, the big word for that is uh, antinomianism, anti is against nomos law antinomian, okay? Not one that we use in church very often, Uh, but that's the idea that, uh, you know, um, I have faith in God, I can do what I want, okay? And uh, that is not what we preach or teach, nor was that what Paul preached as the gospel. But for the gospel to be good news, it has to free you from the burden of the law, Now, the difference between us now and them then is we have the the complete scripture of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. We've got the New Covenant or the New Testament. Uh, What they had was the Old Testament. They were moving from Judaism to being a greater faith. Because Christianity is a faith for all people. Every nation, every tribe, every language, every ethnicity. Uh, God is not um, one who prefers one group over another. And I know that's sometimes hard for us to hear uh, because we like to think that we're better than other folks. But, you know, God loves everyone. And uh, we need to keep that in mind. Uh, even some folks that we might find hard to love, okay? Because God ultimately is love. Uh, I believe that there's Bible for that. Don't you think that's why Paul went to Jerusalem to see the apostles? He didn't want to have a Jewish church and a Gentile church. That's right. He wanted to have one church. And, uh, you know, um, in John 17... Jesus prays that those who did not walk with him but hear about him will be one. And ultimately, the oneness of the church has to be in Jesus. It can't be in anything else. And when we act in the church in ways that divide the body, we are actually acting against the very prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane because what you say with your mouth if it is contradicted by your words, you know, your actions rather, that says something. And we're going to come down to that here in a little bit. Uh, Paul wants people to know, too, that uh, the folks there in Jerusalem 
are not his superiors. They are his peers. And that's important for us to realize. In the Church of the Brethren, we believe that everyone has a ministry. And uh, when we had, when we finally got around to building church houses, we did not have raised chancels because our ministers were called from the body and we didn't want to elevate them above us. Uh, but later on, we started imitating other Protestants and uh, here we are. Uh, but uh, that's, uh, you know, we all have a ministry. Uh, some of us have a ministry of word and sacrament, as other denomination might call it. And some of us have the ministry of the laity. But at the end of the day, we're all equal. We're all equal. We may not have the same function, uh, but we should not exalt those who lead uh, unduly. I think we should appreciate, but not exalt. And there's a difference. Okay. Verse 4, he talks a little bit about uh, false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, our freedom, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. You have to realize that these first Christians, many of them who came from Judaism, continued to go to synagogue, continued to go to temple, uh, continued to do an awful lot of things that they had done before. Because, well, that's who they were. And old habits die hard. And so there's a process that goes on here. And then he says, To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. And he's saying that uh, even though these people, these Judaizers, so to speak, are working against the gospel, whether purposely or unawares, uh, we're not going to give place to them. The gospel that we proclaim is the truth. It is the same gospel that the church in Jerusalem proclaims. And then he says, uh, whatsoever they were, it makes no matter to me. God accepts no man's person. Uh, for they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. And again, he is emphasizing to the Galatians, look, you know, I'm God's vessel I have a revelation. I have an apostolate. Uh, Jesus spoke to me on the road to Damascus. Uh, that qualifies me. And then uh, verse 7 is a key verse. It says, But contrarywise, when they saw the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of circumcision was unto Peter. Uh, basically, uh, they lay hands on him again to go and be a missionary to the Gentiles. And uh, what ultimately happens is that within a generation or two, the church became primarily Gentile. That is to say, uh, the Jewish part of the church diminished because generations pass and traditions change. Uh, I think if we know anything about the history of church, we know that church has changed over time. Uh, we know we are living in a time of very rapid change, uh, perhaps one of the most rapid changing times in, in the history of humankind, if for no other reason, because of the Internet. And you know the last time that there was a technological explosion of information in the world was in the 1400s when you have the invention of the printing press and the invention of the printing press made literature of all kinds affordable and people began to read the Bible for themselves. They began to be more literate than they had been. And when they began to read the Bible for themselves, they began to question the priests, the pastors, the leadership, about what they were being told in the body. And you have coming from that, uh, you know, that's part of the power of the, part of the Protestant Reformation. So Peter has given the gospel to the Jewish folks. Uh, Paul, his mission is to the Gentiles. Sometimes we see Peter's name 
uh, rendered as Cephas. And Cephas means rock. And uh, that is also the name for Peter. Peter is alternately called Peter, Cephas. Uh, Jesus called him the rock. And uh, it's a matter of linguistics. All right, any questions before we move on? Okay, verse 10. They would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. And um, Paul, if you read his letters, was very instrumental in encouraging the churches of the Gentiles to receive an offering for the poor of the Jerusalem church. And uh, that was one of his things. You know, oftentimes I've discovered that uh, when there is a disaster, let's say like Ida or Katrina many years ago, or earthquakes in Haiti or tsunamis, or a church burns down. If you appeal to people, it is like the floodgates of generosity open. And I've actually known of churches, for example, that would go and cash CDs and give it to a disaster offering that you couldn't have pried it loose with a crowbar any other way. And so... They're saying to him, we recognize that the church is one in Jesus, whether you're Jewish or Gentile, but we have to clothe that in concrete acts of compassion and love. Okay? We, you know, the church in Jerusalem, uh, in the beginning, the believers had all things in common, and they were ministered to from the common wheel, as each one had need. Now, you know, that's uh, something that uh, the church today uh, has by and large gotten away from because we live in a nation uh, where they teach us to be rugged individualists. That is, I'm going to take care of mine, you take care of yours. Uh, and we have a welfare system, which is supposed to function as a safety net, but we have lost the art of taking care of one another. And uh, I think where we, uh, you know, we demonstrated in some ways, but uh, some ways we neglect one another. Uh, you know, uh, there are a lot of lonely people in the church that need the care of the church. And we expect the pastor to go visit them uh, but we forget that we're here to minister to their needs too. That's an example of what I'm talking about. Okay, second journey is over. Remember the poor. And then uh, he tells about in the next few verses that Peter was come to Antioch, and it says, I confronted him face to face because he was to be blamed. Because before certain people came from the Jerusalem church from James, he used to eat with Gentiles. And for a Jew to eat with Gentiles meant that you were living as a Gentile. Because they didn't do that. That was something you just absolutely did not do. And uh, when he was criticized for it, it says he withdrew and separated himself. And I think we talked a little bit the last time. You know, two weeks, you forget what you've done. But the last time, I believe we talked about the conversion of Cornelius and his household, did we? Okay, the Roman centurion, and he sends uh, an embassy to find Peter, and Peter's down in Joppa, and he's up on the roof taking a nap, and all of a sudden the sheet is lowered down with all these unclean foods in it, non-kosher foods, and uh, he hears a voice take and eat, and he says, no, I don't eat that stuff. I'm, you know who I am. And again, the voice says, take and eat. And he, no, I'm not going to do that. And the, finally, the voice says, take and eat. And you know, when you hear that voice three times, that's symbolic, okay? 
Uh, you know, Peter had heard the voice before three times after the rooster crowed the three times. Uh, Do you love me? Feed my sheep. And so the last time the voice says, call not unclean what I have made clean. And then Cornelius' servants show up, and that had to be frightening for them because for the Roman army, you know, there was no love lost. And here you have this Roman soldier who sent one of his underlings to fetch you, and you're in an occupied nation. That had to be frightening to them. Uh, But Peter realized that God was at work there, and Cornelius and his whole household uh, come to Jesus. Uh, They're saved. They're baptized. And, you know, Peter says, oh, I see that God's not a respecter of persons. But then when he's criticized, what does he do? And, you know, oftentimes we care more about the applause of people than doing right. You know, we'll do right as long as it doesn't get us in trouble. But when we're criticized for it, then it gets to be a problem. So that that brings us up to 14. And the the bottom line of this is you need to practice what you preach. You need to practice what you preach. That is to say, your works need to be consistent with your faith. What you do needs to be right with what you say. You know, if, if I say, well, I love all of you all, and then I treat you like a dog, which one do you think you're going to believe? I love y'all. Or, you know. So, you know, consistency is important in human relationships because consistency builds trust. And trust is extremely important in the ministry of the church because trust is something that takes a long time to develop and it can vanish in a heartbeat, okay? So consistency leads to trust, and trust is the foundation upon which you need to have if you're going to effectively proclaim the gospel, uh, whatever your mission might be, uh, whether you're clergy, whether you're lay, uh, whoever you are, there needs to be that consistency, and that's one of the things that we need to continually Uh, to strive for that we are consistent in our faith walk. And, uh, you know, um, we all struggle with that. Would you agree with that? That we struggle with that? That it's hard for us to do that? Go ahead. Over the years that uh, has always kind of bothered me, which... I'm like a lot of folks, I do a lot of things wrong and have too much anger at times, maybe to a, I've seen people thinking they're doing God's will. They have a falling out in church and get angry with each other. I don't believe you can do God's work in a spirit of anger. Well, you know, the little book of James says, the anger of man worketh not the righteousness of God. And they think they're doing God's work by being angry and giving somebody a hard time, but they ain't. I don't think you're doing God's work. Well, I often see, uh, particularly in some church meetings, uh, anger expressed. And uh, I think that uh, we forget that when we gather together to counsel with one another to do the work of the church, that, that is every bit as much worship as what we do on Sunday morning. I've seen meetings people who are flat, you know, it's my way or the byway, and I don't think that's right. Yeah, I agree with you. And you know, sometimes uh, when you're a minister, uh, you forget that people have to make their own decisions, and uh, you push a little bit harder than maybe you ought to. Uh, And again, uh, when I talk about trying to force the will of God, 
you know, God uses us. We are the vessels that God uses. But we need to be careful that we don't get mixed up between what's me and what's God. And, uh, you know, integrity is an important part of that. I will also say about Peter that uh, perhaps Peter had forgotten that Jesus often got criticized for eating and drinking with the wrong people. And one of the things that I wish we could learn to do in the church is instead of just expecting people to come to us, find ways that we could go to people and be with people where they are. Uh, Because, um, you know, if you build it, they will come. May have worked sometime. But ultimately, that's not the ministry of Jesus. Jesus built nothing. Jesus went where the people were. And uh, we sometimes forget that. And some of them weren't people that he should have been with, according to his peers. All right, now, we're going to move along. I need for somebody to read from uh, 15 to the end of the chapter. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners and Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of his law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have been even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law no flesh should be justified. But if, if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners. Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those if I build again those things which I destroy, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died in the law, that I may, that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Okay. Now we're getting down to the theme, which is the contrast between law and grace. And um, we've already said that the good news is that our ticket for admittance to this body is not our personal worthiness. It's not our personal relationships with one another. It's what Jesus has done for us and what he calls us to do. And so we are here by the grace of God. Okay? That's the good news of the gospel. Now what happens to us is that once we get here, we forget that keeping the rules is not what got us here. And so we begin to manifest what we might call spiritual pride. Okay? There but for the grace of God go I. And uh, the scripture text I always think about with this is the two men who go up to the temple to pray that Jesus described. One of them said, I thank you, God, that I am not as others. Or like this publican, this sinner over here. And the publican, the tax collector, traitor to his people, beats his chest and says, Lord, have mercy on me. And Jesus asked his followers, now, which one of these went home justified? Was it the one who said, I'm glad I'm not like that? Or was it the one who cried out for mercy? And we know the answer to that. But what begins to happen is that uh, we don't outgrow some things. Uh, One of them is um, 
And I think the church is much less this way now than it was 30, 50 years ago. But we tend to judge people on appearance. Okay? And that is a manifestation of spiritual pride. That is a reimposition of law in what should be grace. And, and you can hear a few country songs about people who go to church and they get invited out. Okay? I think we probably, if we knew there are churches that actually write letters to people and invite them not to come back because they're embarrassed by them. Now, the problem with that is that that ignores the fact that we're not here because we look good. Okay? We're here because God's a gracious God. And God calls us into fellowship with one another not just people of our own kind. That's another piece of it. We'll come back to that one. Uh, another aspect that I would think about is that we often value people for what we think they can do for the church. And we miss whole other populations that may do nothing for the church other than to call the church to love and compassion. And uh, the comment I would make about that is, as we all know, my wife and I have one child. He's 30, 34 years old. Makes me feel old. And he's autistic. He can't sing. He can pray a little bit. Uh, he can't read the Bible, uh, even though he takes his Bible to church when he goes on Sunday. The only thing that he can do besides sit on the pew is ring the church bell. And for many years, his name has been in the bulletin every Sunday because every Sunday he looks forward to ringing that bell. We sometimes forget that God loves people with disabilities. Okay. And, uh, you know, it used to be when, when folks built churches, they didn't think about uh, the fact that they were going to get old someday. And so they put a lot of steps in. And the idea was you were going up. Well, the problematic piece of that is, is that uh, when some of those folks got to a certain age, they couldn't get up there anymore. Uh, sometimes when we gather for things like Love Feast, uh, we forget that some people uh, can't get down on their knees to wash another person's feet. And uh, the important piece of that is not to expect them to, but rather wash theirs. Okay? People come to us not for what they can do for us, but to be the focus of love because then we are doing the things of Jesus. And um, then there's this one, uh, other cultures. Uh, there are days that I believe that the African Americans and the, the Latinos, the Hispanics, are going to be the last Protestant Christians in America uh, because I see an attitude of apathy with us that I do not sense from them. And, um, you know, there is a lot that we can learn from other cultures. But there are cultures within cultures and sometimes it is that we don't understand what people who look like us but act differently than us are doing. And instead of criticizing them, perhaps we would do better to ask them why they do what they do. Because we are often quick to speak 
and quick to judgment. So other cultures can teach us a lot about what it means to be a Christian. Uh, You know, uh, Jesus does some interesting things in the gospel. Uh, There's one place uh, where the woman comes and she wants healing for her child. And uh, I believe that she was basically Gentile and he shouldn't have talked to her. Uh, And he makes the comment that you don't take the bread away from the children and give it to dogs, more or less. And she comes back at him and says, but even, even the dogs eat the crumbs from the table. And he says, your faith has granted you your desire, and there's healing. You know, that's, I mean, they were a much more rigid culture in many ways than we are. Uh, So, you know, we learn from other cultures. Um, The Hispanics have taught me an awful lot just watching how they do church. And it sort of shows up uh, that some of the things that we see as so important maybe might not be as important. And that maybe we spend an awful lot of time doing busy work instead of doing the Lord's work. So I I give that to you to think about. Uh, And there are many other things that, that I could say, but I want to quote Paul on this. Romans 14, 4 Who are you to judge someone else's servant to their own master, servant, stand or fall? And they will stand because the Lord is able to make them stand. And then he goes on in verse 13 in the same chapter. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. That's a challenge for us because when we put obstacles in others' ways, we are doing the same thing that the Judaizers were doing for the Galatians. We are making it hard for them to follow Jesus. We're making it difficult for them to be Christian. Uh, We are adding on to the gospel. And uh, the purpose of the law for the Christian is to show us the, the enormity, the weight of the separation that is between us and God when we try to achieve our own salvation and the depth of the grace and mercy of God in what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. So when Paul says here, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, He is saying, when Jesus died on the cross, the law was nailed to the cross. My efforts to justify myself were nailed to the cross. What I thought I could do, I discovered only God could do. Then he says, nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, that is, I'm the vessel, And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live what? By the law? No. He says, by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me. Who loved me. Not when I was good, but when I was out there. And gave himself for me. And he ends with this, I do not frustrate the grace of God. I do not contradict the grace of God. I do not stand against the grace of God, the unmerited favor which God gives. For if righteousness come by the law, that is, if I can justify myself because I'm a good person, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews, I have a PhD, I'm cute, I'm good, I'm sweet, then there would be no need for Christ. And we all know that there is a need for Christ. And if I can do all that, then Christ died in vain. And of course, in the Christian faith, we believe that he did not die in vain, uh, but that his death opens the door for us 
to receive the forgiveness of God. And in the forgiveness of God, we are born as new people with a different outlook on life. And we begin to be less concerned about who we are and more concerned about following Jesus, keeping our eyes upon Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter, the author and finisher of our faith. Now, I'll say this to you, and I hope you understand what I'm saying. I come from a place that has wiggly roads, sort of like the one that comes up this mountain. Okay? And there are a lot of curves. There, there are a lot of places where the geometry is not quite right. But every once in a while, you come to a wide place in the road. And the wide place in the road gives you the freedom to get around some things. The wide place in the road for you and me is forgiveness, grace, and mercy that allows us to turn and to change and to be what God has created us to be instead of what we have created ourselves to be. So that's your sermon for tonight. Uh, Anything else we want to say about chapter 2? Let me see if there's anything in this little booklet I wrote that uh, I think uh, I need to say that I may have not done. I think it was in, I read in uh, Wycliffe, said that the Judaizers were spouting propaganda instead of the gospel. Yeah. They were giving their opinion. And we hear that a lot today. Everybody's got an opinion. And most of them, like mine, they ain't right. You know, they're the most. <laughs> well, that's why we need to one another. Stick to God's word and see what his opinion is. There's a little uh, prayer that I've got here. It's by Soren Kierkegaard, who was a Danish theologian and philosopher of the 1800s. And this is what it says. Teach me, O God, not to torture myself, not to make a martyr of myself through stifling reflection, but rather teach me to breathe deeply in faith. Amen. Which means that you should not spend all your time reflecting on all the awful things you've done, but to receive the freedom that Christ gives to move beyond those things. The last thing that I want to say is that uh, my cousin's house burned down in 1978. And his sister-in-law's hamster, Nosy, Nosy the hamster, was lost in the fire. And I still think about Nosy because Nosy went round and round in his little circular cage all the time. You've seen those things. Oh, yeah. If we try to justify ourselves, if we try to say, here I am, God, look at what I've done. We're like the hamster, always moving, cage always turning. And... um, you know, ultimately that has to come to an end. We have to die to that so that we can live to Christ. And uh, we will talk some more about that as we go along. All righty. Let's see. Sheldon prayed to begin with. Gwen, let's have you pray. Dear Lord, thank you for letting us be here tonight. Thank you for all those who came out and we had the opportunity to hear David as he taught us about Paul and his journey. Dear Lord, please be with us as we travel home. Keep us safe. Help us to live like you would have us to live. And I know sometimes that's really easy to say and very hard to do. So help us be with us, guide us, and as a church, help us to do the things that you would have us to do. 
Thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All righty, if it doesn't rain or get foggy, I'll see you all next week. <laughs>